It's time for Wretched Radio with Todd Friel. Story time! But a true one this time. Well, sometimes they're true. Sometimes they're not true. But it's not a fractured fairy tale, I'll tell you that much. This is Wretched Radio. I do believe it was uh, last week the topic of Michael Servetus came up as he is oft brought up by the atheist to throw it into the face of the Christian. John Calvin murdered a guy. Is basically the bottom line. They like to use it as a polemic to state that the Bible is wrong. Now, you and I know the syllogism the, the, the logic doesn't make any sense. The, the debate over God's existence, Jesus Christ dying for sinners, the veracity of the Bible. The atheist will come along and go, yeah, well, why did John Calvin kill Michael Servetus? As if that has anything to do with the subject at hand. Now, if you want to debate the story which is indeed a challenging one for us in the 21st century. I get that, but don't let the atheist undermine any sort of, uh, use this as an attack on the deity of Jesus or the veracity of Scripture, because one doesn't have anything to do with the other. However, if we make our way through this story, it might also help us understand how we can help the world who seems to be a bit confused about statuary these days. Maybe you saw the report. There was a stat. Thomas Jefferson. Oh, George Washington was. No, that was Christopher Columbus. I think maybe George Washington. He's been caught in this also. But it was Christopher Columbus. Who, somebody put a, put a sign up on the statue. He's a racist. Therefore, we don't remember anything good that Christopher Columbus did while we stand on the soil that he discovered. And even, I believe it was a president of university uh, somewhere in Virginia said, this is nonsense and it has to stop. Yay. Somebody. Finally. Perhaps understanding history will help us to help people. Because, look, it's a little bit tricky. Maybe you've got a pet. Okay, Tony, do you have any sort of issue Mm -hmm. that is like a really sensitive one because of ancestry, because of the, oh, oh, okay, okay, all right. Let's say you knew somebody who died from drunk driving. All right, that that would be sensitive, would it not? Painful. Mm-hmm. Now, if somebody yeah. brought up the subject of drunk driving straight away, it's going to put you on edge. Second of all, anything that they might have to say that perhaps doesn't sound like a full-throated condemnation of drunk driving would probably cause you to bristle. I think we can understand that, can't we? I mean, if your ancestors had been mistreated by certain people, when those people, when their names were brought up, wouldn't that cause you to go, uh, what? You want to say good things about somebody who was involved in the oppression of my ancestors? I think we can understand that, can't we? And can't we even be sensitive about that? Now, I think we need to be careful that we don't want to automatically go into the opposite ditch and just completely condemn that person for one aspect of their life that was terrible. As sensitive as it might be, we don't want to overreact. Did Thomas Jefferson own slaves? Yes. Were there some extenuating circumstances? Sort of. I'm not saying it's justified, but yeah. Furthermore, Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he wanted all people to be considered free. And yet, in the Constitutional Congress, it was indeed a contentious issue, the South fighting for their peculiar lifestyle and way of living. And they recognized, I think history will bear this out, that if Thomas Jefferson, the predominant author of the of the Declaration of Independence had included freedom for all people, it wouldn't have passed and we wouldn't be doing fireworks on the 4th of July. And it was a compromise. And yet, a man who owned slavery wanted slavery outlawed. 1776. So now there are some people who say we should never celebrate anything about the contributions that Thomas Jefferson made. No statuary. Now we can be sensitive to that, can't we? Hey, being sensitive to people doesn't mean you're giving in on the argument or not making your point. It means 
you're being sensitive. So let's make our way through the Servetus affair to see if we can figure out how do we think about these people who did things that we just find abominable today, including the execution of somebody who had bad Trinitarian theology. This is from placefortruth.org, the Servetus affair. I'll read pretty much the whole shebang. It's, it's, it's well done. Michael Servetus believed that reformers like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Bucer Farrell, Farrell, and others were not reformed and reforming enough. And he saw it as his calling to correct that error. In other words, Michael Servetus was the first discernment blogger. That's what he was right there. <laughs> so at 21 years of age, he published De Trinitatis Erroribus, The Error of the Trinity, in which he attacked and denied the doctrine of the Trinity, calling it the deception of the devil. Michael Servetus believed that he might draw some notable reform theologians into debate and create a radical reform, which was, was his goal. However, all he felt was pressure to retract his position. Nobody took the bait, which he did, by the way. He did retract it in his second edition. However, it didn't appear to be a truthful retraction. So he continued to teach his incorrect theology, and he didn't put it into print. Smart. But decided to take up medicine instead. Not a bad idea. In France, he achieved a notable reputation writing books and giving lectures, but he had a quarrelsome personality, which is something that a pastor shouldn't have. And it wasn't long until he made a nuisance of himself among the medical community in Paris. Did you know this about Servetus? He seems to have always been looking for the extreme position no matter what field he labored in. In medicine, he apparently believed that knowing astrology gave the doctor the upper hand. And he was not so shy to belittle his colleagues for their lack of starry knowledge. And so he had to leave town. Now, what do we do with that information? Does that help us with the statue issue? It does. Here's how, I think. Today we go, Servetus. It's a bonkers idea. Now, does that mean Servetus was bonkers? That he was dumb? Clearly not. He he was a medical doctor. He, he he had written books and gave lectures. I don't know if he was a doctor, but he was he was teaching medicine. He wasn't an idiot. Just wrong on a subject. Time can do that. When you live, a lack of access to the knowledge that we have today could cause us to look back and go, dodo brain, or worse. No, he wasn't. Just wrong. Uneducated in an area that he didn't know about. And that can be true for other issues, even some issues of theology, if they're not primary issues, and even some moral issues, even for a Christian. The story continues. What also seems to emerge from the study of his life is his obsession with Jean Calvin, Sometime after 1540, he wrote to Calvin 30 letters. That's obsessive. He was seeking to engage Calvin in a Trinitarian debate. And he asked him if he wanted, Cal he asked Calvin, do you want me to come to Geneva? He ignored the letters, but he wrote to him to say, don't come. Rejected. No one seemed willing to engage his views. So apparently, in exasperation, he sent Calvin a document that he had written called Restitutio, which had been secretly published in 1553, and it revealed his heretical reviews. Uh, now we know you're a Trinitarian heretic. And Calvin had the proof that he had never forsaken his anti-Trinitarian heresy. So on, October, on August 13th, 1553, Servetus was spotted in Geneva. Somebody told Calvin, saw him. He escaped jail from Lyon was to be shipped back to France for trial in that city, but Servetus begged to be tried for heresy in Geneva. Don't let anybody fool you that John Calvin, he, he killed him. No. Servetus, seeking publicity for his heretical views, said, I want to be tried for heresy. Begged for it, knowing that it could be death because that was the government punish for, punishment for heresy in those days. His desire to make a name through a controversy knew no bounds, and so they honored his request. Did you know that about the Servetus story? 
Now, they found him guilty, sentenced him to be burned at the stake. Throughout the trial, Calvin went to him and begged him repeatedly, recant, recant. He failed. Calvin then sought a less painful death. He didn't seem to argue that hey, we shouldn't be putting people to death for heresy. Eh, hey, that, could, that could be an Old Testament argument, but not a New Covenant argument. Didn't do that. Was Calvin, therefore, to be disqualified for all of his good teachings? No, that was the way it was at the time. Time has a powerful, persuasive power. I'm not sure that that was redundant or not, or repetitive, even just a little bit over and over again. But we need to be able to look back on history and go, hmm, did the times influence the way they thought, and did that disqualify that individual from being honored and followed? Next on Wretched Radio. Thanks for listening to the Wretched Segment Du Jour. If you'd like more Wretched, you can listen to the most current stream for free at wretched.tv slash listen, or you can become a club member and listen to our entire archive. Wretched, reaching the lost, equipping the saints, and strengthening the local church.